this is Angela. Welcome to Discovery Church. You are not here by accident, and it's a blessing to share this content with you today. We'd love for you to join us on a weekend if you are ever in the Orlando area. Check out the website, discoverychurch.org, for service times and locations. We'd love to see you. All right, let's get into the content for today. We pray it blesses you wherever you are listening. Hi, my name is Tanya Nogler, and uh, about four years ago, my husband Mark and I started down a road to adopt. So we were a family of six. Um, we had four teenage boys, and the story is better when Mark participates, but he's on the other side of the screen right now filming. So we started off looking to adopt uh, a small sibling group of two. We ended with four. Uh, a year into having our four, uh, it became real chaos in our house, day and night. It was really bad, um, and we both actually thought um, that God was wrong in the whole adoption process. Who we adopted wasn't right, that we adopted wasn't right, we were ruining our pre-existing family. We were really questioning whether or not what we did was right and if we heard God right. Fast forward in about a year, um, our oldest adopted daughter was really difficult. It was pretty much chaos in the Nogler house. So we did all the things we knew to do. We read books, we got wise counsel from Christian people and psychiatrists, Christian psychiatrists, non-Christian psychiatrists, um, our pastors at church and nothing really worked and we prayed and we cried but we prayed a lot so that led us to bringing our oldest daughter to a Christian uh, girls camp in another state where we felt she could heal and pray and find herself and simultaneously our family at home could heal but with our oldest camp was not working she was beating the system so she was in camp altogether about nine months we brought her home and we just decided we're just going to give it to God because what else can we do? We, there's nothing else we could do. We literally had no more money left, no more resources left, and there was nothing left but to hand everything over to God um, and trust that He would make good. She's been home from camp now for just over a year and I was telling Mark the other day that I can't believe how far we've come and what a joy she has been and how much I enjoy the time we spend together talking and cooking and carpooling now that school's in. And so what literally I thought I would never see or say, I can say to you now because the Lord stepped in and we gave over the reins and that's changed our whole family. Well, perhaps you're in a place in life today where you're in a God-only situation, where you need God to do it. You know, when God steps in and does something that only God can do, just as we just heard, then God gets the glory. Friends, God wants to move in your life, mine, to do things that are unexplainable apart from Him. So um, let me just encourage you, if you're in that place in life, to give over to him and cooperate with him to the fullest extent possible that you might experience his movement in your life in a way that can only be explained by him so that God gets the glory. He wants to be unexplainable in your life. Do you know that? He wants to do things that only he can do. And uh, it's our job to cooperate with him and do all we can to facilitate that. Well, so glad you're here today. Uh, those of you at East Campus, Southwest Campus, if you're watching online, so glad that you're with us. I was encouraged this past week when one of the men on our staff uh, told me early Tuesday morning that his wife was going to host a big rock party. Now, if you weren't here last weekend, you have no idea what I'm talking about, okay? So it's important that you do understand what a big rock party would be. And so let me take you back via video replay just like the NFL, okay? Video replay to last weekend, so I gave an illustration about big rocks. So you need to understand that, and even as we move forward in the message this morning, so give this, give this a watch. Ray tells the story of a rabbi. He has a lot of rabbi stories. He tells the story of a rabbi who came into class one morning. He put a 
a glass jar on his, on his desk. And uh, he began one by one to fill this glass jar with these rather large size rocks. And when he got this jar um, filled up to the brim with these um, rocks, he turned to the class and he said, is the jar full? To which the class said, yes, it looks, looks full to us. Well, at that point, he reached down behind his desk and he grabbed a, a cup that was filled with some smaller rocks, some pebbles, I guess we would think of them, and he began to pour them in. And as he did this and kind of shaking the, the glass to get these pebbles distributed throughout, he continued to go and he said, is it full? The class wasn't quite as quick to respond this time, not knowing exactly what was coming next. And at that point, he reached down behind his desk and he grabbed one more cup and then he began to pour in even smaller rocks. We call it sand. And after pouring this in and pretty much uh, filling the, the, uh, the jar with, with the sand, he then turned to the class and he said, life is like this jar. Our lives are like this jar. We fill our lives with many different things, some larger than others, some things more significant than others, some things not quite as significant, and then some things which, frankly, are very small and not significant at all. Our lives are indeed filled with many things, some big, some small, some significant, some not significant at all. Knowing what the big rocks are in life and ordering your life and organizing your life around the big rocks of life, friends, it's important. It's really important. So I was encouraged when I heard that this woman, wife of a staff guy, was going to get some other women together to say, let's just talk about as we enter into this year, what are the big rocks of life that we want to order our lives around? Well, Jesus tells us what the big rocks of life are, and I began last week, and I want to continue this week, and let me go back to Matthew chapter 28, the final words that Matthew writes in his biography on the life of Jesus. He writes this. This is on the heels of Jesus' resurrection. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. If I were to summarize what we read there in one sentence, I would read it this way. Live as a disciple and participate in making disciples of others. You know, the Bible tells us that there are only two things that are going to last for all of eternity. The souls of people and the Word of God. Everything else stays here. Everything else eventually turns to dust. Just two things are going to last for all of eternity. The souls of people, men and women, and the Word of God. And so Jesus, as he meets with his disciples, and according to Matthew, one last time, he says to them, therefore, because that's true, go forth as disciples, making disciples. Live as a disciple and participate in making disciples of others. Now, last weekend in the message, I tried to answer the question, why that's so important, why we should build our lives around that. If you missed it, I would encourage you to go online and watch the message. This week, I want to talk about how. How do we do that? Two important questions. How can you and I grow as disciples of Jesus, and how can we help others become and grow as disciples of Jesus? Well, I believe the answer to that question, to both those questions, can be found in Acts chapter 2 as we look at the life, lives of the people we find there. As we unpack the practices, if I can call them that, that we find in their lifestyles, we find how you and I can grow as disciples of Jesus and how we can help others grow as disciples of Jesus. We refer to these around here as the six practices. I want to talk to you about three of them today 
And then next weekend, we'll look at the other three. All right? Look with me at verse 41, chapter 2 of the book of Acts. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. The context is this. Jesus has ascended into heaven. 120 of his followers gathered in an upper room. They waited for the Holy Spirit to come. The Holy Spirit is imparted to them. They leave that upper room. A great commotion hits the city. A great crowd of Jews who were in the city of Jerusalem for Pentecost gather. Peter gets up to speak. He gives a brief message about Jesus. He talks about Jesus having given his life, the crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection. At the end of his message, the people want to know how to respond. P Peter tells them to uh, repent of their sins, that they would be forgiven of their sins, that they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And there were 3,000, it says, who accepted his message, were baptized, and were added that day to their number. They became disciples of Jesus. Now, on the heels of that, we have in verses 42 to 47 what I like to think of as the very first church. And within this first church, we find the practices of these new disciples. So here's what we read in verses 42 and 43. They, speaking of these 3,000, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. Many wonders and miraculous signs were being done by the apostles. Let's just stop there. What we see here is a group of people who gathered together as a spiritual community. They gathered together for, we read, four purposes, for teaching, for fellowship, to the breaking of bread, which I believe in this case is a reference to the Lord's Supper, to worship, and to prayer. Now, our modern-day equivalent is what we're doing right now. We call it church, a worship service. These brand-new disciples of Jesus practiced gathering together as a spiritual community. In fact, it says that they not only gathered, but they were devoted to these things. In other words, they weren't casual about this. They weren't lackadaisical about it. It says they devoted themselves to these things, to gathering together as a community. All right, now, as I reflect upon this whole idea of gathering together and specifically reflect upon the idea of being devoted to that, I, I have seen over the course of my lifetime erosion, if I can call it that. Let me, let me explain what I mean. <clears throat> my parents became followers of Jesus when they were teenagers. My mother shared with me as I grew up uh, when she, as a senior in high school, had someone present to her the good news of Jesus. It was not a message that she was familiar with. And when it was presented to her, um, she responded just, if you will, like the people in Acts chapter 2. And, and she asked Jesus to come into her life, to be her Savior, to be her Lord. And as she said to me, uh, Donnie, my, my life changed. Overnight, my life changed. I went to school the next day, and I, I was a different person. Inside and out, I, I, I felt like a different person because I had come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, as a result of her coming to know Jesus, my father much the same way, my brother Ken and I were raised in a home where God and the things of God were important. They were, they were a big rock, I guess you could, you could say. So the church was important to us. We grew up attending church on Sunday mornings. Unless we were sick or on vacation, we were there on Sunday mornings. And it wasn't just for a worship service. We also attended what at that time was called a Sunday school class. So for us on Sunday mornings was typically two hours, not just one. Most Sundays we came back on Sunday evening for the Sunday evening service. Midweek as we grew up, we typically found ourselves at the church. Again, the message our parents sent and the message we received was gathering together as a church is a big rock in life. It's important. <clears throat> All right, now you fast forward to the 1990s. Marianne and I have three young children. As it comes to gathering together as the church, things are beginning to change. Uh, Sunday evening services are now a thing of the past. You know, they've been replaced in many cases by small groups, which in our case would, would be the case. Uh, we no longer attended two services on Sunday morning. We just attended one, and midweek was, was and frankly, optional. Optional because life had become so busy, sporting events and other kinds of things that our kids were, were engaged in. 
surveys done at that point in time told us that the most committed of church attenders attended three out of four weekends a month, meaning they missed 12 weekends a year. Well, if you fast forward to the present day, those same surveys now reveal that the most committed of people attend twice a month. And so even as I go into the message today, I can't talk about big rocks because without understanding the illustration I gave last week, the surveys tell me that 30 or 40% of you weren't even here, didn't hear the message. Now, fortunately, because of technology, today we can go online and we can look up an app and we can, we can go back and, and, and look at things. But friends, in a word, what's taking place with regard to the gathering of the spiritual community, we see erosion, spiritual erosion, I would call it, taking place. Spiritual erosion, if I defined it in a sentence, I would define it this way. Spiritual erosion occurs when a big rock in the eyes of God becomes a little rock in the lives of God's people. So as we begin this ministry year, I want to challenge you and I want to encourage you. Is the gathering of the church a big rock in your life? You know, a year ago, I put out this same challenge. I encouraged everyone in the church, southwest, east, watching online, get here early. Get in your seat. Be ready to worship. When the service is coming to an end, don't, don't bolt out. Wait till the very end. Let, let, let God do all that he can do in the, really the short time that we have together as a community. I put out that challenge a year ago. A few months later, I received a, a brief note from a woman named Christine. This is what she writes. Don, I have to admit I was a little frustrated when you challenged us to be early to church, ready to worship, wholeheartedly. With two small kids under three, it is a challenge to get out the door on time. And I thought to myself, I understand that, been there, done that, okay? Uh, three young kids, I know what that's about. She said, I made excuses in my heart to explain why we are often late, but then I felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I started setting my alarm 15 minutes earlier on Sunday, and for the last few months, we are consistently early to the 9 a.m. service, and it has been wonderful to be fully engaged in the worship time. Thank you for calling us consistently and uh, to faith-filled living, Christine. You can build a church on people like her. And friends, I just want you to know that I'm going to continue to challenge you, encourage you to be about the things that God defines as a big rock. And one of the things that God defines as a big rock is gathering together with this thing we call the church. Erosion is a natural progression of life. If you don't fight against erosion, erosion will occur. I once had a full head of hair. <laughs> erosion. I once had muscles. They weren't very big, but erosion. Friends, a natural progression of life is erosion, and the world around you will do everything in its power to erode your spirit. Don't let it happen. These people devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to worship, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were being done by the apostles. Friends, may that be the practice of the disciples of Discovery Church. Let's move on. Verse 44. <clears throat> All the believers were together. They had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as they had need. They practiced giving. The spirit of generosity was evident among them. Jesus said it is more blessed to give than it is to receive, and apparently these people believed him. Now, in this particular case, the kind of giving that we see them doing is what would be called an offering. This is the second of the two ways in which the Bible speaks of giving. Go back with me to the very last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, where in a very single, single passage, the two types of giving are referred to. Let's pick up at verse 7. God is speaking through the prophet Malachi to his people. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. In other words, you, you've departed from my ways of living. If you make a choice to come back to me and live into my practices, if you will, then I will return to you, God says. You know, you know I don't know if you realize it, but God's a gentleman. God doesn't force himself upon anyone. God 
God responds to us to the degree that we express ourselves to him. So this is what he says here. So you, you ask, he says, how are we to return? In other words, can you give us an example? God says, yes, I can. Will a man rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. Tithes and offerings is how you rob me. Now, here we have the two types of giving referred to. There's the tithe, which represents 10%. And then there are offerings above and beyond that 10%. Many of you participated in giving an offering just a few months ago when we came to you and said, would you give a, a, a scholarship to someone to camp? And we had hundreds of students enabled to go to camp because many of you stepped forward. Thank you for the spirit of generosity. Months before that, we put out to you a challenge on behalf of the children of Compassion International and said, would you sponsor a child? 450-some children were sponsored by the people of Discovery Church, friends, because of your giving. It's an offering. What a wonderful thing that says so much good about the heart of Discovery Church. But he's referring here to not only offerings, but to the tithe, okay? Now, there's a result of the fact that these people were robbing God of the tithes and offerings. And it says in verse 9, you are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. He said, you're forfeiting the blessings that I want to pour into your life. He says then, bring the whole tithe, verse 10, into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now, we all know language matters. Language matters. And you'll note that it doesn't say here, give the whole tithe. It says, bring the whole tithe. Now, in this case, I believe the language is specifically chosen because, you see, you can't give what isn't yours. You can only bring back what isn't yours. I've used the illustration before, uh, about a year ago. Um, I can't think of a better one, so let me use that same illustration. If you've heard it before, just hang with me for a moment, okay? Let's say that my car breaks down, and so I'm going to take my car in for uh, the repair shop for a week. And I learn just before doing that that you're going to be gone on vacation for a week. And so I come to you and I say, listen, I, I'm kind of in a jam. I'm without a car this coming week. I hear you're going to be away on vacation. Could I borrow your car? To which, of course, you say what? Oh, yes, by all means, love to have you borrow our car, okay? So I take my car into the shop, I borrow your car for the week. A week later, you come back, you call me, and you say, hey, return from vacation, just want to make some arrangements to get the car. At which point I then say to you, well, you know, Marianne and I have been discussing and praying about the return of your car. <laughs> At which point you're thinking what? I'm sorry, why, why would you need to discuss that and pray about that? And then I say to you, well, you know, we're just not feeling led to return the car. <laughs> to be honest with you, we like the car. In fact, your car is better than our cars. <laughs> so we're, we're thinking and praying about this. Now, at that point, it'd be fair to say that you're not only probably a bit confused, but maybe even bordering on being offended. Because you see, at that point, if we keep the car, what is your car, what would you accuse us of? Stealing. Stealing. Well, friends, Psalm 24.1 says this, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. In other words, all that you and I have belongs to him. Friends, we are managers. Everything we have belongs to the Lord. God says, bring back to me at least 10%. It's mine. Bring it, that back to me. It explains why you hear us say often before we bring our offerings that the Bible teaches simple formula, give first, save second, live on the rest. Because we bring back to the Lord what is rightfully his. And I want to just say to Discovery Church that in the past year I've been deeply, and our elders are deeply encouraged by what God is doing from a giving standpoint. I taught on this last fall uh, a fair amount, and um, friends, I got to tell you, you, you heard God's word and you obeyed. And the level of participation across all three campuses over this past year went like this. 
And friends, to that end, I'm not only thrilled for us as a church, I'm thrilled for you, and I'm thrilled for you because of what verse 10 then goes on to say. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room for it. Friends, God is a giver, and I can tell you over 50 years of practicing this in my own life, my family's life, you cannot outgive God. God says, test me in this. Jason Martin um, is a volunteer here. He and his family attend and have been for several years, and Jason's on our finance team, and he uh, participates uh, heavily in helping to give leadership to FPU and our Compass classes because he's impassioned about helping people live into what the Bible says about uh, giving and about handling the resources God has given. So after the classes of last spring, he sent me a brief email and just said, Don, I want to just give you some class highlights, and this is what he wrote. We had a total of 37 households go through either FPU or Compass during the spring. Of those 37, they paid off $44,160 in debt, had new savings of $76,288, cut up 58 credit cards, and seven of them either started giving for the first time or significantly increased their giving. The average household had a $3,300 turnaround in a matter of eight weeks. Friends, this is... <clears throat> this is because there were 37 households that began to live into what the Bible teaches. And what God wants for you financially is freedom. Freedom. So giving is a part of that. So these early disciples, they practiced gathering together. They practiced giving. And then I want to hit one more big rock. In fact, I want to go back to verses 37 and 38, even before this fellowship is formed. I've already referred to it. Peter gets up, he gives this message about Jesus. In verse 37, it, we read, and the people heard this. They were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, but brothers, what shall we do? In other words, we just heard the message about Jesus, and something in our heart rings true. So what do we do? Verse 38, Peter replies, repent, repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter says here is if you choose to ask Jesus to come into your life to be your Savior, to forgive your sins, to be the Lord of your life, he says God is going to place his presence, his spirit in your life in the form of his Holy Spirit. The significance of this cannot be overstated. Jesus had said back in the book of John, chapter 16, verse 7, he had said this to his disciples, it is for your advantage that I am going away, for unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Now, can you imagine if you're Peter or Andrew or James or John, and you're listening to Jesus say to you, hey, guys, I just want you to know it's to your advantage if I leave. What are you thinking? You know, Jesus, you're right most of the time, but that last statement, that's off the wall. But friends, he wasn't off the wall. Here's what he was saying. As long as I'm around, then my presence, God's presence, is limited to my proximity to you physically. But when I leave, and it's not until I leave, God is going to send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will reside within you 24-7. It's to your advantage that I leave so that you can have my presence all the time. Well, this is what we refer to as the practice of abiding, being able to abide, to dwell in the very presence of God. Friends, it, do you realize today that if you know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, he's come into your life, do you realize that the very presence of the great I am resides within your life, resides within you? What an awesome thing. As a result of that, we can abide in his presence. We can dwell in his presence. We can build a relationship. Question, how are relationships built? Like, what, what, are the, what are the component factors of building a friendship? Is it not true that there are just basically three? Three factors that enable a relationship to be developed. And those factors are time, communication, and shared experience. It's, it's nothing fancier than that. 
It's by spending time with someone. It's by communicating with someone. And it's by having shared experience with someone. And the more time you spend with someone, the deeper the communication that takes place, and the more shared experiences you have, the deeper the friendship begins to grow. Everybody with me? All right, it's just not that complicated. Well, let me tell you something that I, I think is, is simple and yet really profound, and that's this. Developing a relationship with God works the exact same way. Friends, sometimes you know, people think about, well, relating to God, I mean, I don't know, I, I, how do you do that? I mean, it just, it just, I don't know how to get my arms around that. How, how do I do that? Friends, can I tell you, it's no more complicated than time, communication, and shared experience. The way in which you and I build a relationship with God is we spend time with him, we communicate with each other, and we do life together. And the more time you spend in God's presence is the more time and effort you put into communicating with God and listening to God, and the more you engage him in the everyday events of your life, the deeper your relationship with him grows. And whether you started relating to him last week or whether you've been relating to him for decades, it never gets more complicated than time, communication, and shared experience. I read a statement some time ago that I really like. It reflects a practice in my own life, which is when I get up in the morning, almost every morning, the first thing I do is I spend time alone with God, communicating with him. Almost every day. The statement reads this, and I really like it. You must never face the day until you have faced God, nor look into the face of others until you have looked into his. I cannot expect to be victorious if I begin my day in my strength alone. To which I say, amen and amen and amen. Time together in the morning to start your day. Time to communicate. Do you know that God is a communicator? He speaks in a number of ways. Two of the primary ways in which God speaks is through his word, he went to great lengths to write a book, a love story to you and me. God communicates through it. It's a living word of God. The other way in which he communicates primarily is through his Holy Spirit. In other words, he's put his voice box within you. You understand that? He's put his voice box within you. So I start my day. You say, well, okay, so you start your day, you get alone with God, you spend time, you spend time communicating. Like, what, what do you do? Well, let me just give you a really simple outline of what I do, in effect, in the morning to start my day, uh, time with God, communicating with you. I can give it to you in three simple phrases, okay? Number one, I review yesterday. I review yesterday. I simply say, you know, God, I want to look back on yesterday. How did you show up in my life yesterday? What was happening in my life yesterday? And what ends up happening is that that thought of yesterday and reviewing yesterday ends up revolving around two things. The first is, what took place in my life yesterday which was not pleasing to you? We call it sin. What attitudes might have been expressed in my life? Where might there have been a case of hypocrisy where I, I kind of projected one thing, but the reality of that was not true inside of me? What things that I say to someone else which I say, boy, I wish I could put that toothpaste back in the tube. Because you see, I want to be right with God. I want to have the channels clear. I don't want to have any sin in the way. I'm talking to a holy God. So therefore, what took place yesterday that I, I need to just, and, and so I take a moment and I listen. And then God brings to mind, well, you know, you, 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 you had... You had those words that you said to Marianne. You, you really need to retract those. You, you need to own up to those. You know, you express that attitude to someone. There was a frustration spirit that you communicated to so-and-so. And And in in a sense, it feels like I'm clearing out the spiritual pipes of my life which sin has clogged. And after doing that, then I turn to the other side and I say, okay, God, where in my life did I experience your goodness yesterday? What can I worship God for? What can I thank God for? And then I listen again. And friends, I, I literally keep a record of all the specific things for which, little and big, that I can thank God for his goodness in my life. Just a review of yesterday. When I'm done doing that, then I surrender today. 
I look at what's ahead on the day, and I literally go through the events of my day coming, at least as I know them, and I just one by one surrender them to the Lord. And then I, as I surrender each one, I take a moment to listen, and I say, God, is there anything that you would like me to know about that upcoming event? You say, well, does God speak to you in an audible voice? No, he could, but hasn't to this point in time. But friends, if I have the Holy Spirit residing in me, then I have to believe that when I say to God, God, speak to me. You know, I've got staff meeting coming later today. What is it? Is there anything other than what I've got planned that you'd like me to assert in that? I'm just going to sit and listen for a moment. Friends, I've got to believe that if God's voice box lives within me, that God has the ability in that moment to speak to me, to put thoughts in my head, which can I tell you, he does. Some of the best ideas I come up with I didn't come up with them. I'm letting you in on a secret now, okay? It's in times of listening that God brings that thought to mind. So go through the day. Surrender it. And then the third is the requests of tomorrow. Now, when I say tomorrow, I don't mean the 24-hour tomorrow. What I mean is... Lord, these are some things that I bring before you because they haven't happened yet, and I would love to see them happen. So I'm going to lay them before you. And then I listen. I listen. God, concerning these requests, what is it you're wanting to say to me? Shape my thinking related to these things. Somewhere along the way, sometimes in the beginning, sometimes at the end, sometimes in the middle, I open God's word and I read some portion of, of Scripture. In my case, I keep all this in an organized journal. I started journaling decades ago. I start a new journal every, every January. I have a specific one that I go to the store and I buy. It's a three-section journal. It's the same one. I, you know, every year, keep one. I would guess that you understand the idea of a journal. There are numerous benefits. I laid out to the staff not too long ago what I believe to be 10 benefits of journaling. I don't have time to give you 10, but can I give you two as we wrap this up? Okay. The first one is a journal enables me to organize my spiritual life, to organize it. I'm guessing that in your work life, many of you have some kind of an organizer. You have some kind of a mechanism that you keep a day planner or something by which you organize your work life. I'm guessing if you're a student in school, you have some mechanism by which you organize your school life. I'm guessing that some of you moms have an organizational system for your family because a lot going on. You say, well, why do you organize a work planner or a school planner or a family planner? Why? You say, because there's so much going on, there's no way I can keep all of that in my head, so I have to have it written down. That's exactly why I have a spiritual life journal. Friends, think about it in terms of the big rocks of life. You know, one day your work is going to end. Someday your schooling is going to end. Someday your family is going to end. Do you know that your spirit's going to live for all of eternity? Why in the world wouldn't you want to organize your spirit? I was looking at my journal the other day, and I was totaling it up. I have about 40 names of people that I pray for regarding healing. They're in a place of where they need God to show up and bring healing. If I didn't have their names written down, how in the world would I remember them all? No, I don't pray for them every day, but when I do go through the list and do pray, pray for them, there's no way if I didn't have it written down that I could do it. I keep a list of all the prayer requests, and when those prayer requests are answered, I put down, answered. It's important to not only record the requests, which, by the way, are way too many to remember if I didn't keep them in organized fashion. And it's a wonderful thing to be able to look back and say, that was answered, that was answered, that was answered, that was answered. See, when you realize that God's answering prayer, do you know what? It impacts your desire to pray. Amen. I keep an entire section in my journal that I just call the goodness of God a record of his movement in and through and around my life. I could take you back to, to August of 1998, and I could tell you how God showed up in my life and I experienced his goodness because I have a journal. You know, off the top of my head, I know what he did. But friends, when I go back and I read that section of my journal, 
You know what it does? It, it, it takes sometimes in the most difficult seasons of life when I've got my fist up toward God or what it feels like my fist toward God, and I read that section of my journal and I see the goodness of God over and over again. You know what happens to my fist? It becomes an open palm. You know what the difference is between this and this in your heart? The second benefit, and I'll wrap up with this, is a journal helps me to live God-centered. It's tough to live life God-centered. You know, life is meant to be lived in response to the voice of God. Life is meant to be lived in response to the voice of God. God is a communicator. He speaks through his word. He speaks through his Holy Spirit. He speaks through the circumstances of life. He speaks through people. But you and I have to position ourselves to hear his voice. You know, the temptation is to live in response to the world around us, to the circumstance of life. The temptation is to live in response to our emotions. The temptation is to live reactively to life. Friends, God designed you, and he's placed the Holy Spirit as his voice box within you so that you and I can live life in response to his voice. Can I tell you something? That's where the action is. When God speaks and you respond. You know, in John 16, 7, Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I leave, for it's not until I go that the Father will send the counselor. Some translations say the helper to you. Do you realize that you have a counselor if you're in Jesus today who re resides within you and it's just not any counselor it's the great I am Amen. and through the course of your day as the circumstances of life unfold that counselor wants to impart wisdom to you and as he does if you follow it you're going to walk in the wisdom of God So friends, as it relates to these practices, God sent his son Jesus, gave his life so that you and I could be participants in this community we call the church. Friends, it's a big rock. Be devoted. God is a giver. Money is one of the many resources that God gives us to steward. Stewarding money according to his guidelines is a big rock. Most importantly of all, God placed his very presence within all of us who know Jesus, and he did so that we could abide in his presence and live life in response to his voice. These are three big rocks in the eyes of God. It's my prayer that they'll be big rocks in your eyes and lives as well. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the good work that you're doing in the life of our church and for the growing number of disciples here, and not only a growing number of disciples, but the growing number of people who are giving their all to follow you with all their heart. Father, we, may you continue to fashion us in the ways of the Acts 2 church so that, Father, as we return to you, you return to us and we experience all that you have for us. Hopefully, many, many, many moments in life where we say, that's only God, only God, only God. For we need you and want you to be the great I am in our lives. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit. May we live today and the days ahead this week in response to your voice to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen.